we had actually a lot of people there, even though none of you guys were there. But, uh, we had a great time. And so if you have nowhere to go or just want to come and even if you don't like football, uh, come fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Okay, I think that's all I have for you. I'm going to invite Tanya up because she has some things that she would like to share. Well, today is safe to be a kid with Mike as Mark had mentioned, and we're highlighting the pregnancy center. People have been doing a really good job of bringing stuff in. Wednesday's the deadline, so... Hi. <laughs> so, uh, Monday night, if you come for home group, that's a good time to bring your donations, and also Wednesday night, you can bring some things. The Pregnancy Center did not have a list of things they absolutely needed, so I know from working there that size 5 and size 6 diapers are always their big thing, but they take care of people from pregnancy all the way through to age 2. And a little bit about the Pregnancy Center for those of you who might not know them. So if you find out you're pregnant at about four weeks, we have one obstetrical office in Emmett County. And can anybody guess at what week they will start taking patients? Four? Somewhere between nine and 12. Okay, so you find out you're pregnant at four weeks, and then at nine to 12 weeks, some people get lucky and get in at eight weeks you have a five-week gap to sit and stew about your pregnancy. Is everything okay, or do I even want this baby? Do I even want to be pregnant? And you have two places you can go in Emmett County to find out. You can go to Planned Parenthood, or you can go to the Pregnancy Care Center. The Planned Parenthood will tell you that it's a lump of cells until you're about eight weeks pregnant. The Pregnancy Care Center will give you an ultrasound at six weeks. That'll confirm that the baby is where it's supposed to be, and you can also see a beating heart on the ultrasound screen, which the Pregnancy Care Center does not have to do a whole lot of persuading women. All they have to do is say, let's check a viable pregnancy. They see the heartbeat. They see the baby. They make up their own minds. They're not stupid people. So um, 9 out of 10 of the women who get an ultrasound at the Pregnancy Care Center choose life, which is an amazing thing. And also, the community is pleased to see the Pregnancy Care Center as a viable medical service when you consider that you aren't seen until nine weeks in and you're finding out in four weeks. So that's one of the big things that the Pregnancy Care Center does. That takes up a lot of their funding. They have a nurse, a physician, and all kinds of counselors and volunteers for that. Other things that they do, we don't let them just choose life and leave them alone. Uh, material support, as you've seen, they do give it away, but they earn it through parenting classes, which the courts in Emmett County refer people to and accept for parenting classes. And they are amazing. They're things that you pay for, like a new kid by Friday, or the Bernstein method, or uh, how to understand your baby's cries. These things that you would go online and pay money for, they're giving them for free at the pregnancy center. Matching them with a counselor that stays with them through the process. Also, education on healthy pregnancy, lifestyle choices, and most importantly, the gospel through everything. They have a fatherhood program where men work with men, and that's a lot of fun for them. So it's a major ministry. It's got a lot going on. Emmanuel supports them on a monthly basis, which not a whole lot of churches do. And Promise FM is going to highlight the Pregnancy Care Center, which is 93.5, I think it is. On the 23rd, from 4 to 6, they'll be broadcasting live from the Pregnancy Care Center. So if you want to hear more about the ministry and how you can get involved, tune in there. Uh, supportersofpcc.org is the website for people who want to help out. But otherwise, um, if you can bring your donations in today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, we'll get on with it. And uh, we do have a video that we would like to share at this time. And this is um, actually had been requested for some of the home group leaders to share or to make. And uh, the word got out that some of them, the word got out that some of them know how to do videos, as you can see. And so uh, the home group leaders were able to put together a video for Saints of Kingdom Life Sunday that's actually going to be shown at uh, various churches all around Petoskey today. And so, of course, we wanted to share that here with you as well. And uh, go ahead, Nathan, and we'll get started. The numbers about abortion are staggering. Last year, it was the leading cause of death in the world, killing 42 million people, according to the World Health Organization. And out of the roughly 4 million pregnancies in the U.S. last year, approximately 1 million ended in abortion. Abortion remains the leading cause of death in the United States. 
according to the Guttmacher Institute, there are three main reasons for this tragic reality. One is that parents feel unable to sufficiently provide for their child. The second is relationship problems in the lives of the parents. And the third is sadly that many people view a baby as too much of an inconvenience to take on. A fourth reason that we would like to add is the epidemic of a, a simple lack of knowledge of the abortion procedure and pregnancy in and of itself. Intervening on the behalf of the unborn grandmothers mothers should be approached carefully with wisdom and preparation for the cost. Interventions should target the problems at hand. One such problem is material assistance and financial counseling. Another very prevalent issue that we see is emotional support, guidance, and positive relationships. There is also a very real need for factual information about the child they carry and the truth about the abortion procedure itself. These interventions both save and change lives, and we believe that they should be supported, evaluated, and protected. These interventions are currently underway in your own community which are made possible by the Pregnancy Care Center of Petoskey, and many of you as well. There is a definite need in your community for support for these interventions. Of course, in the form of financial support, and then secondly, and very importantly, in the form of prayer support. The Bible does remind us, after all, in James 5.16, that the prayers of a righteous man avail much. As with any ministry that you would consider supporting, we believe that it's healthy for you to evaluate these interventions for yourself. Observe here some numbers from our annual report from last year. And the third option for supporting these interventions is of course to protect them. There is a lot of hostility against the pro-life stance in the world today. So it's crucial to vote for the preservation of these interventions. Protection and preservation of these interventions is also accomplished by volunteering your time and your resources to the cause. Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, what does it mean? Can we really try to understand the sanctity that each life has without acknowledging the one who gave it that sanctity? Sanctity involves a purpose a set-apart purpose with an inherent value placed over that person. Psalm 139 says, For if four my inward parts, men be together the mother's womb, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created the womb to be a safe and secure place for life to begin. But statistics say that in the U.S. are more likely to be killed there than anywhere else. Though these truths can sober us, rejoice. You've had your life sustained by God's hand. And you walk as a valued and cherished creation of God. Today, many people claim that their lives have value and purpose, yet deny the one who ascribed it to them. Human life is a gift of God, which makes it sacred. And don't mistake my word for it, because God displayed this truth Himself by sending His Son and taking the punishment for all of your sins and all of my sins back on that cross, so that we may live. And Romans 5 8 states this too by saying that God demonstrated his love for us, and that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this reminds me of Jesus' words, in which he said, Because I live, you too also shall live. And this just defines the gift of life, and it's freely given to all who will submit to him. So if you really want to know about thank you for life and what that means, you need to look no farther than the cross of Jesus. Thank you, and God bless. You see, you guys did a tremendous job with that, and uh, support from uh, some of the ladies in the group, and, and uh, the word's getting out to churches all over our community uh, about Sync to Human Life Sunday, and, and, and not only just the Sync to Human Life, but how that translates really into the value that God has placed on each life so much so that he gave his life so that we could be with him forever. And so it's an incredible um, testimony of really God's grace and, and goodness.
Um, we're going to transition at this point, and we'll have our little ones go down. And Sonia, I'm going to invite you to come on up here, actually. Come on up here. And uh, uh, Julie, and you guys have enough help today, too? Okay. All right. And Sonia has an announcement about oh, yes. the uh, ladies' nice. night. And then I'm going to ask if you would pray. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, ladies, we have a gathering here tonight, uh, this Friday at uh, the... 25th, uh, 6 o'clock, so we're going to have potluck, and um, we might have a hymn sing, there's some special things we'll go do, and so please come join us, any of you that want to, okay? So let's pray. Father God, we give you the praise today for just bringing us together, Lord, in this bitter cold time that we have here in Michigan, but Lord, it's so good to come into your house and to worship you. Just feel the warmth of your spirit, Lord, all around us. So we thank you today, Lord. We just ask that you would also, not only as you're with us, Father, be with those who are suffering right now with colds and other uh, things that are going on with their health, Father. We just praise you because we know you are the healer. And we thank you right now, Father, because you have also made a way for each one of us for that precious gift of salvation that you've given us, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Even though we are sinners, Lord, you've come to us today, and to see and know that you are here present with us is just so awesome. So we thank you and praise you because we know that as we come together, we not only get to share and fellowship, but, Lord, we get to hear your precious word. What a, what a marvel that we can have that word every day of our lives. So today, as we corporately come together, Lord, we just ask for your mercy, your strength, and your healing. We know that we do not meet at one time ever that you are not present. And we just ask that you would just do the work that you see to do, Lord, in each one of our hearts today. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the message that Pastor Mark is about to bring us, for the scripture that will be read by Father. Open our hearts for all of these things. Lead and guide us, Lord, because we need you so desperately. And we ask, Father, in a precious way now that we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let me turn your Bibles to Psalm 82. Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, son of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. You may be seated. So today, we're really going to look at this psalm, and it deals with judges and judging and all these kinds of things, laws and, and justice. Uh, came across some different laws that are in our country, and you may have heard of some of these, um, that are unusual laws that are probably not very often enforced, such as 
in Marion, Ohio, it's illegal to walk backwards while eating a donut. <laughs> so I hope that no one has done that before because that, that you could be arrested for that. Also, you may not know this, but the Ohio Driver's Education Manual states that you must honk the horn whenever you pass another car. So if you're driving down I-75 through Ohio, I hope you kept this law of honking at every single car that you pass by. That's on the books there. It's also in Ohio illegal to fish for whales on Sunday. So, uh, the other days you can fish for whales in Ohio, that's fine, but not on Sunday. It's also illegal for more than five women to live in the same house. Now that makes sense, actually. That's, that's probably a good law to have in the books. Uh, not to be too partial to Ohio, Michigan has its own laws too, such as uh, in Detroit that it's illegal for a man to scowl at his wife on Sunday. <laughs> so, ladies, that's a good law, wouldn't you say? We should we should um, expect expand that one to the rest of the state. It's also in Detroit illegal to let your pig run free <laughs> unless it has a ring in its nose. So then it's okay. And another law, this is a, and you may not have known this, but there's actually a three cent bounty for each starling and a 10 cent bounty for each crow that is killed in any village, township, or city in the state. So you've been missing out on some money, really. The three cents for a starling and 10 cents for a crow. However, just in case you think that this is your new career, uh, the law was repealed in 2006, so sorry, uh, you're not going to get any bounty for that anymore. So these are some of the, the laws that are out there. Uh, there's really a bunch of other interesting laws on the books. But we also know that there are some, uh, all joking aside, there are some very disturbing laws that are being passed in our nation. And I want to share with you some of those that are really not a laughing matter. And what we see, really a strategy, and this is true from uh, Mao's regime in China to Hitler's Germany, the premise is, is the same, is that if once Christianity cannot, or once, uh, well the strategy is that to deny freedom of religion in the government sphere. And then all you simply need to do is expand the sphere of the government to the church. And then you have no freedom of religion. And this was, is always the strategy, and you can see it actually being done even in America today. Consider these laws of how uh, the, sphere, the spiritual sphere, our freedoms are really being taken away from us. In San Jose, California, the city moved to ban a manger scene from the public square, yet spent $500,000 of public funds to erect a statue to... Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec god of human sacrifice. In Irmo, South Carolina, an otter student was told that her portrait of Jesus could not be displayed with other artwork because of its religious content. In Missouri, a student group had to go to court to win the right to meet in school. They did not want to bring weapons or drugs into the school, only their Bibles. In Virginia, a principal told a handicapped girl that she could not read her Bible on the bus since the vehicle belonged to the school district. And in California, a homosexual was fired from the church staff, sued based on discrimination. The fact that the church eventually won the lawsuit is of small comfort, for such a trial could be held as even a serious threat to free our religious freedom. And in Nebraska, a judge upheld the right of a U.S. West communication, U.S. West communications to fire an employee, Christine Wilson, for wearing a pro-life button to work. The judge said that it would have caused undue hardship on the company to reasonably accommodate the woman's religious observance or practice. And so you can see that that uh, how the state is encroaching or on the. Re on the church, isn't it? And we're seeing these things happen. Very disturbing laws that are being passed today. And we should see more and more of these things happening in the future. How does this psalm speak to all of this? And this is a psalm of Asaph. You can see that right at the beginning in the, the title of the psalm. Asaph's psalm is really like a sermon that's given to judges. 
They are his audience, and he speaks very plainly to them. Uh, often we think of the Psalms, and we think of things that are very sweet, like Psalm 23, and we love those kind of Psalms. Sometimes we think of Psalms like 150, Praise the Lord in the Sanctuary, and, and more of those kind of praise songs. But this is a Psalm that really uh, instructs, or instructs or exhorts, kind of corrects. Asaph is seeing the bribery and the corruption and the things that are going on, and instead of taking a sword, really, he takes out his pen, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he begins to write this very prophetic song. And it's not one that you've probably heard preached before. It's a very unusual song. But we're going to get into it today and see really how it is applicable to not only judges in the time of Asaph, but also to the judges today, but even more specifically to our own congregation. And so let's dive in and take a look at verse 1. And right away here we have an unusual statement, don't we? It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How many gods are there? One. One, right? Do we believe like the Mormons that there are many gods and that we can become gods? No. No, no we do not, right? So there's a, uh, we see here, well, what is this getting at? Well, Jesus tells us that this psalm does not refer to gods but to humans. And this is in John 10, 34 and 35. And it says that the gods are, refers to the people to whom the word of God came. And who these gods are, lowercase g, are really human judges who are acting on God's half, behalf to enforce laws. And so they were told to not, or they were told to, told to show partiality because, uh, or not to show partiality because judgment belongs to God. And so what, what it's saying here is that those who are able to make decisions or to or to give right judgment, that the Hebrew word for God is occasionally used for human judges. Why? Because that's God's domain. God is the one who makes laws and judgments, and he is the one who is not impartial in that way. And so this lowercase g are those that are acting with just a small portion of that dominion or authority that God has. And he's letting them know that they've been given some of that authority but in this case, they had not used that authority correctly. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what's going on. In Great Britain, you have the House of Lords, right? Are they saying that everybody's a lord? No, they just it's saying that because they have some authority. They have some dominion. They can make judgments and they make decisions. And that's what God does. And so it's lowercase g. They're not gods. In fact, they're men who will die. If you look in verse 7... It says, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. And so these are, uh, even though they're considered men of authority, Asaph is reminding them that they're really no different than each of us. We know that death is the great equalizer, isn't it? And that all men will die. And so in this psalm, we have this kind of heavenly court scene that's going on. And God is presiding. Who's on trial? It's these judges and leaders that are ruling in Israel. And if you look then in verse 1, that God is standing. Uh, he's, it says uh, he's taking his place in the divine council. Another translation says that he's standing even in his place. And we think of judges. Judges, do they sit or do they stand? They sit. They sit. Some of you have been to court, haven't you? So you know, you know. They're sitting. Who's standing in the courtroom? The plaintiff. The accused, right? The accused stands, and the judge sits. It says Moses sat to judge the people. That's the position of a judge. So why is it that he's taking his place, and in the, in the Hebrew here, it's talking about how he's standing. He's standing there. Because, and here's the really cool thing about this, is God is standing because when the, the weak and the vulnerable are being accused, or those who are wrongly treated are being accused, God is saying, you're accusing me. That he is really standing as if in their place. Uh, isn't that a, it's a powerful statement? That God is not sitting like a judge, but he's standing the, uh, there's a danger with how we treat people because God is saying that that's how you're treating me. 
And he's standing just like he did for Stephen. If you remember when Stephen was being stoned, and we see Jesus came and he stood. Uh, normally he's sitting at the Father's right hand, but he came and he stood up. He's taking notice. He's saying, the way that Stephen is being treated, I'm standing as if I'm being accused. Because Stephen is, is being judged on account of me. And so, uh, God is standing in the midst. There's this courtroom kind of scene that's going on. Those that are being accused are the unjust uh, judges. And God is ultimately going to have his way in this courtroom, isn't he? Uh, things are going to not go well for those that are doing unrighteousness. And, excuse me here, if you look in verse 2, you can see it says, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And then uh, it says in verse 3, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And so God is really presenting his case, if you will, before these unjust judges and the things that they are doing. I came across this in this book by Irma Lutzer, who is the pastor at Moody Church in Chicago, and he wrote a book called The Cross of Hitler, and he shared this, and I think that it's appropriate for today. He said, though we are critical of Hitler for removing the Jews from the category of personhood, we who live in America should not forget that we have our own word games. A slick legal maneuver of our Supreme Court arbitrarily asserts that a certain category of persons can be denied the rights of personhood. Preborn babies are not human, the court said, and therefore do not deserve constitutional protection. Millions of infants have been sacrificed to gods of immorality and convenience with the full protection of the law. Unfortunately, those who shout that they are pro-choice deny choice to the very person who has the most at stake. The arbitrary morality of the Supreme Court decision of 1973 is not the first time that the people have been classified as non-persons by the High Court. Dred Scott was an African-American slave who served as army surgeon named John Emerson. When Emerson was stationed in regions where slavery was prohibited, Scott sued for freedom. How could he legally be bound as a slave in places where slavery was illegal? Much to its shame, the Supreme Court ruled that blacks were not intended to be included as citizens of the United States, and therefore could not expect to have constitutional rights. Blacks were described as being of inferior, or, inferior order, and the slave was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and traffic whenever a profit could be made by it. That's what the Supreme Court said. After the Civil War, Congress approved a constitutional amendment that guaranteed rights to all persons. We applaud that decision, of course, but are grieved that another class of human beings has since been denied legal protection. When we no longer protect the weakest among us, we display a heartlessness that grieves the heart of God. We must repent of our own silent holocaust, in which 5,000 tiny victims lose their lives every day. What is the case against the unjust judges? What have they been doing wrong? The question that is asked is, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And then right after that, you have this word, salah. Does anybody know what that word means? Stop and think about that. It means stop and think about it. There's, it's, a, it's a pause. And sometimes we have that in songs where there'll be a have a break and there's just music playing and that's time to really think and consider what's being said, isn't it? And so it's law, it's, it's pause. Think about what's being said. Think about this question that's being asked. Could this apply to judges today, Supreme Court, Appellate Court, County, Local, all these things? God's word is still true, isn't it? And when you read through this, you say, well, this reads like it could have been written today, right? It's timeless. God's word is timeless. And we know that God holds government responsible to act justly. And this is why we have government. And God has standards that he's put in place. Romans 13 talks about the role of government. And we should thank God that most of our judges on all levels are wor worthy men and women, are they not? And I think that we could say that that, that is true, that they are, uh, for the most part, uh, honorable men and women. 
And we should rejoice for that. There are some countries that that is not the case at all. And extortion and bribery are the only way to get, uh, uh, to get what you want. Uh, it also couldn't be clear that we see this, that God sees every decision. And every law that is contrary to the heart of God, he takes notice of. And that means that all these laws that we see that are, that are starting to happen, that are going to continue to happen, from abortion to marijuana to homosexual marriage, that, you, that judges have someone to answer to. And it means that the majority opinion is not always right. How many know that to be true? true. The majority is not always right. And so what the psalmist here is saying is pause or consider. What should they be doing instead? He lays it all out. In these other verses here, verses 3 through five, uh, three through 4. Uh, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the Lord. They're saying they're not doing everything that they should be doing, and they're doing everything that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, they are in the wrong. And those that are already suffering, their suffering is being added to by the injustice of those who are judges. So what is the condemnation? Look at verse 5. It says, They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. So they don't have knowledge. They don't have understanding. Uh, really, two things that are going on here. They don't, they don't have knowledge. They don't know what's going on. Now, a judge is supposed to know what's going on. They're supposed to know what the what uh, what's happening. They're to have understanding, and also they're not even seeking it out. To be a judge means that you have knowledge and righteousness, but the Bible is saying here that they had neither, and they didn't want. It. And so that's what was going on in that day. It's the same thing that's going on in our day, isn't it? And we see that that these things are things that that God takes notice of. But I want to share with you all here today, really, because none of you are sitting on a court, right, as a judge. So how does this apply to all of us? It's still a good question for all of us to consider, isn't it? Verse 2 there, how long will you judge unjustly, show partiality? Or are we doing these things that the judges are to be doing? Because each one of us is really to govern our own lives. And this becomes very personal. Are we, how do we treat people? Are we fair? Are we deceptive? Do we use other people for selfish gains? What do other family members think about us? Do they regard you as demanding or caring, complaining or grateful? All these things. In families, do we listen to both sides of the situation? Or do we just get, get evidence from one side and then pick and choose and divide and all these kinds of things? How about in the church life? How do we do all these things? Are we really... Uh, considering how we're managing and how we're making decisions and all these things. Sometimes we can think that maybe we will not be accountable and that we can personally decide what is right. But God has in his word what is true. And, and we, we heard this expression before me, but it says that truth has no expiration date. So when does truth expire? Never. If it's true, then it's true today. And in the psalm here, everyone had failed to govern their lives as God wanted them to. And I think if you're like, if I think in knowing you, none of us would want to be counted in this group. None of us would want this psalm written about us, right? We wouldn't want to even go there. And we know that um, one day, ultimately, that God will hold everyone responsible. And so each one of us really needs to take this too hard. I remember uh, in Sunday school one day, Sylvia, some of you remember her, Pastor Joel's wife, she was sharing about this great injustice that had been done to her. And I think, in a sense, we can all relate to that. Some uh, injustice or maybe selfish ambition of someone else that ended up being harmful to you. And this happened to Sylvia something uh, very, um, that injured her very much. And we were talking about justice and that in the end that God is going to have his way and that the, the wicked will face judgment, a righteous judgment. 
And she got so excited. It was, it was so cool, in a way. Um, she just got, just was elated to know that, because this guy had went free in this life, but that he would not go free in the end. And she just was so excited about that. We know that each one of us will give an account for our lives. The Bible talks really about two different places of judgment. There's one for the believer. What's that? The famous seat of Christ, right? There's one for the unbeliever. What's that? White the great white throne of judgment. How many want to be judged at the famous seat of Christ? <laughs> if you're a believer, that's where you're going to be judged. The unbeliever will be judged at the great white throne of judgment. And it says in, in uh, Revelation 20, those that are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're not found there, they will be cast into the fire. And not only that, but that, that those, even those that are in that are judged at the great white throne will give an account for their life. In Luke 20, verse 47, it says that those that which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. I'm talking about these religious hypocrites that really didn't love God and were pushing people away from God, said that the same shall receive greater damnation. And so those that are not in the Lamb's Book of Life will be at the great white throne of judgment, and everything will give an account. And people will be judged accordingly. And that, that means not everyone's going to be judged the same. But there are some that are going to receive even worse judgment because of how they live their life. That God is going to take everything into account. But for those of you who are Christians... We will be judged at the Bema Seat of Christ. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You see, Psalm 82 is a reminder that judges are accountable to God. But so are you, and so am I. And there is coming a day that you will, you may not be on the bench as a judge, but you will be before the bench. And the judge of, earth, of the earth will call every one of us into account. And how will we respond to this? I also came across this little story I want to share with you. Sometimes, even in the church, we can lose sight of this. And I want to give this story just as a, as a reminder of, of uh, here's a time that at least this particular church had failed to be the church. And this was a letter that was sent um, to Right to Life supporters uh, about a small church on the East Coast uh, where a pastor had delivered a sermon on abortion. And after the service, a German man came who up, who had lived in Nazi Germany, and told of his experience. He said this, I had lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it, because what could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance, and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to the death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing <coughs> hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. Years passed, and no one talks about it anymore. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me. Forgive all of us who call ourselves Christians, yet did nothing to intervene. Then Erwin Lutzer explained about this, and he said, That story which so speaks so poignantly to the weakness of the church in Germany, speaks also to us. Do we hear the train here in America? The cries of the pre-born children in our abortion clinics, the abused child across the street, or the minorities who are daily discriminated against in the normal course of their existence? 
Or does our busy service for Christ drown out these muffled cries? It's a lot, right? It's a lot. We know that the punishment for sin has already fallen, hasn't it? And it fell on who? Jesus Christ. On Jesus Christ. That, when we know Jesus Christ, then we will not go to hell. No matter what we do because of who we belong to. Because Jesus paid our debt. That's it, our sins on the cross. But you will still be accountable for how you live. Not to determine whether you go to heaven or hell, because that's set when you receive Jesus. But really to determine loss or gain of reward based on how we live our life. In Revelation 22, verse 12, it says this, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. There's a difference between a gift and a reward, isn't there? If someone gives you a gift, did you do anything to earn it? No. Nothing, right? It's just freely given. It's not based on your own merit or something that you've done. You didn't earn it. It was a gift. Is salvation a gift or, re or reward? Yes. It's a gift. All right, you guys are a, a good church here. It's a gift, right? If anyone said reward, we come see me afterward. And we'll <laughs> sort that out. It's a gift. You didn't do anything. It's a gift of grace, isn't it? We're saved by grace through faith. What is our response to a gift? Is to be thankful, right? Someone gives you a gift, thank you. That's all we can do, isn't it? A reward, though, is something that you earn. And you get rewarded through uh, something that's, uh, that's merited, isn't it? Should we want God to reward us? We should. It's a good desire, isn't it? Because it means that we're living to please Him. And the Heavenly Father loves to reward His children. And now we know that it's, it's by God's grace, and the Bible talks about this, it's in us, working in us, and through us both to will and to do, and the will of God is by His grace. But the decision to serve, or the diligence in doing that, the way that we choose to act or not is our responsibility. And God sees this as potentially rewardable. And we should have that desire that, that we would be rewarded because we want to, and we have then lived our lives to please and honor our Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read a few scriptures here to you in closing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10. And you can turn there if you can find it in time, otherwise I'll go ahead and read it for you. It says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can say, lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, that's the day of the return of Jesus, will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And so, who is this written to, the believer or the unbeliever? Believer. The believer, isn't it? And it's saying that the, the fire God will be like a test, everything that is wood, hay, and stubble, all that's going to get burned up, really. The things that are lasting is really our, the things that we do in love, and that we are, uh, when we're following, what the the works that God has put in advance for us to do, when we're living in the way that God has us to live, we know that those things will stand the test of time. And when that judgment comes in, that there will be a reward for those things. In 2 John 1, 8, it says, Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose heart what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. John was desiring to win that full reward. He had worked, he had watched his life, and he knew that I don't want to lose these things. I want to live my life fully, knowing that, that there's going to be a reward, that there's going to be, that God is going to be pleased with things with my life when it's done. In 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, it says this, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. 
And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? We should not be deceived, church, that everyone will be accountable. And it doesn't matter what position we hold, does it? Uh, someone has said this, he says that, uh, uh, that we will all answer to someone. And that someone has a capital S, and that is not for supreme as in court. That we are accountable to someone, capital S, who is Jesus. That means then that we can lose our reward, but we can also gain reward. In Matthew 6, 19-21, it says this, But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Should we follow our hearts? Well, I would say yes, if, if your heart is, is longing and loving the things and valuing the things that God loves and values. And when our heart is set on the Lord Jesus Christ, we know then that we will want to accumulate treasures not here on earth, but in heaven. And this is, this is what will stand the test of time. This is what God honors and will reward. And that means that even if you don't receive reward here on earth, that if you invest in the things of eternity, you live your life as an investment into the things of the kingdom, that God will honor that one day. Isn't that good news? It is. And the Father is standing in that courtroom, and he's taking notice of everything. And he's going to give a good, a proper, and a true judgment. Not like, er, not like imperfect earthly judges, but perfect judgment. And that should be something that we look forward to, doesn't it? I want you to flip back to Psalm 82. We're going to close with that last verse. And I'm going to ask uh, for our worship team, you guys can come on up. says this. It says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Are you living your life today that we can say that with full confidence? Judge the earth, knowing that we're a part of that, right? And we know, we, sometimes we think, well, judge that person, right? But are we willing to say, judge the earth, meaning including me? Are there areas that we have to grow? The Bible would say, Salah, pause, consider, think about that. We know that we can be quick to find fault with others, but the Bible says to examine our own lives, doesn't it? Are there inconsistencies in the thing, the truth that's timeless in the Word of God about how we're living uh, with actually how we're living? Uh, I love this from Ruth. It said that this is Boaz speaking to Ruth. She had such care toward her mother-in-law after the death of her husband. It says something that is going to honor God? Yes, it does. And, and Boaz speaking to Ruth said, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and the full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz saying, I can, I can bless you with things, but your real reward is going to be the Lord repaying you for the good that you have done. A full reward given by the Lord. Why? Because she cared for her mother-in-law. In church, it's not complicated, is it? It really isn't. It's loving God and loving other people. And caring about those that are weak and vulnerable. Standing up for those who, who are not able to. And we know that when we stand for Jesus, like Stephen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to, and Father, forgive them, even as he's being stoned. When we love in that kind of way, God takes notice. And, and scripture says he stood in notice of what was going on with Stephen at that time. Come, arise, O oh God, judge the earth. The last word in the scripture is, is this, isn't it? It's come quickly, Lord Jesus. Can we say that with full confidence and assurance? Are there things that we need to set right in our life? 
I want to really allow time for a salah or a pause as we close our service here. There will come a time, we know that God, when the judge will come to judge all mankind, whether you're saved or unsaved. If you're saved, you're going to be at the Bama Seat of Christ, where everything will be laid out and will be rewarded based on how we live. If you're unsaved, you'll be at the great white throne of judgment. The Bible says you'll be cast into hell. We don't want that. We don't want that. Jesus is coming. He is our only hope. Can we say come quickly? Come quickly. As a mic's playing, I'd like for you to have a moment of salah or consideration. Uh, let God speak to your heart. Maybe he's calling you to, to take a, a bolder witness, a greater stand. Maybe there's someone that you have not loved very well. Maybe there's someone that you need to forgive. Maybe there's someone that you have walked by too many times, and God is calling you simply to stop and to care for that person. Maybe there's something you can do for the pregnancy center, to make a stand for the unborn, those that are the most vulnerable in our country, but who are being annihilated so frequently. <laughs> Father, as we're turning our attention to you, as we're seeking your face, Lord, we pray that you would uh, speak a word, Lord, to your people today. We know, Lord, that, that I've, I've shared my part, but we need to hear your voice now. We pray that you would speak to each heart that is here, that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying, that we would respond, Lord, knowing that your word is true. Let us pause and consider, Lord, how we are living our life. And Lord, we pray that the things that we need to confess, that we would confess that. Now, the things that we would repent, need to repent, we pray that we would change, that we would turn from our wicked ways, and that we would turn toward the Lord Jesus Christ, who offers grace and mercy as gifts. Lord, we do pray that each one here could say that we are looking forward to the day of judgment. Uh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We know that it's only with a clear conscience before God of man. So we pray that that would be true, Lord, and that you would compel us to even greater works of love and sacrifice. Lord, that we would have Holy Spirit eyes to see those who are in need, and that we would do something about it. We know that it is by your grace to even will, will that in our lives, to give us the desires, and to fulfill that. Lord, so we have nothing to boast in, Lord, but we do pray that we would take our responsibility, Lord, that we would be sensitive to your leading and spirit, Lord, and that we would obey, simply obey the things that you have for us to do each day. Let's be sensitive to your voice as you speak to us in these moments of pause and consideration. But we know, Lord, that we also need you each day. So we pray that we would continue to have ears to hear as we leave this place, that we would be a changed person, growing from glory to glory, Lord, as your grace abounds more and more in our lives. Uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your gifts. We look forward to your rewards. We pray that, that each one of us Lord, we continue to seek your face. 
we find our rest in you. We ask in Jesus' name.